All right, welcome everyone. Take it away, Jackie. So, in case you're in the wrong place, this is welcome to grow your own organic chickens and other poultry. Um, we're the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, and we thank um, you for coming here and all of the people that supplied photos for this. Um, just one thing before we go to the next slide. I'm Jackie Perkins. I use feminine pronouns, uh, she, her, and herself. And I am the organic dairy and livestock specialist, Mofka. I've been formally trained in dairy science, uh, but I have backyarded it with the entire list of poultry that Anna put up there, plus a couple of things. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, what is Mofka? Um, we're a lot, of, a lot of things. We partner with certification. Uh, we train new farmers. Our big to-do is the Common Ground Country Fair, um, which we are working on doing an alternative version this year. Um, we have one of the biggest uh, groups of volunteers uh, in any organization in the state of Maine. Uh, we do some education, uh, ship. Uh, what I do is a lot of technical support with farmer programs and educational events like this. <laughs> so, um, if you don't already have poultry, there's the question, what kind of poultry should I get? Uh, and there's just a bunch of different kinds, as was pretty obvious by the poll question that you guys, you guys already know. Um, and there's, there's the things to think about. Do you want eggs? Do you want meat? And those are the obvious ones. Some of the other things um, that I've known people to do are some, some hobby showing. Uh, it makes a really good 4-H project for introducing children to agriculture. And um, nobody mentioned it, but there, there are recreational activities like uh, homing pigeon races that you could do. Um, so you just kind of decide which one to go from there. We'll go to the next slide. So for any of the kinds of poultry that you want to think about, um, there's production breeds and there's heritage breeds and there's pros and cons to both. Um, the production breeds usually have increased output, but they require more input. Um, they're not they're not as disease resistant as some of the heritage breeds. Um, they they tend to be a little bit heavier in parasite load, uh, but they are usually bred to be pretty docile and easy to handle. Um, and the heritage breeds, they're, they're often bred to be great foragers. Uh, they're close to the wild, so they had to just go find their own food. Um, uh, the breed characteristics are, are more diverse. Uh, they can, I've noticed for my own self that the heritage breeds are a little more aware of the predators um, and they'll, they'll hide from them a little better. Um, but they do grow a lot more slowly. Um, so I, I have a nice animal handling video on YouTube channel for Mofka. Um, and there's, there's a webinar where I talk about some basic chicken, ling, chicken handling. But one thing that I didn't mention was that uh, in, one of the things you need to consider is whether or not you want a male in your flock and they're pretty handy to have around because they will stop fights between your hens. They'll round them up and show them where food is. They'll chase them into the shelter if they see a prayer. Uh, they're, they're very, very into the welfare of their flock. But as far as handling them, you have to understand that the more you antagonize them, the more that they're gonna fight you. So if you or your kids or anyone that visits is kind of picking on your rooster or your drake, you, you, it's one thing you should stop. 
um, because it, it makes them super defensive and super aggressive. So uh, if we go to the next slide, here's an example of some chickens that there's, there's uh, one heritage breed chicken in here and there's some hybrid chickens in here and maybe somebody can kind of pick it out and tell me the difference and if um if you think you know tell me in the chat Ooh, yes the darkest one yeah well done guys now you guys all picked up on it because i had mentioned that they're slow growers and you can see that the the black one has kind of still fluff on their head um like i said at the bottom of the the picture they're all about the same age but the big difference is the ones that are fully feathered are hybrids and the darkest one is a heritage breed. So they do definitely grow slower. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, so one thing, if you're gonna raise your poultry and you wanna do it in an organic manner, there's some things to consider, um, especially if you wanna get certified, but some of the things that certification looks for is that they're managed organically from the second day of life. And they say that because organic hatcheries are few and far between and they certification tried to take into account shipping time. Um, so that means food, space, uh, and bedding. Um, once they get old enough, you provide access to the outdoors there are other uh, allowances for weather. Um, the handbook that Mofka Certification Services puts out to their producers lists things like extreme temperatures, violent weather, um, feathering and molting. Weather events are short term as opposed to seasonal weather. So you can't just say, oh, this is the hot season, they stay in. Uh, you kind of have to provide for that. And you can keep birds inside uh, if there's a predator threat, but you also have to put forth a plan to get rid of the predator somehow. So um, we're also avoiding antibiotics and hormones. Vaccines are still permitted, uh, especially in poultry because there are sometimes only genetically modified vaccines that are available on the market for poultry. Um, it gets a little complicated, but if you wanna be certified, you can go through it with your certifier. Um, if you're managing different flocks, then identification systems can be used. Uh, you can use leg bands of different colors, or you can use different color breeds for different age groups. Um, the different colored bands come in handy if you wanted to say, uh pick out the roosters or you were growing several different ages of poultry that you were selling to your neighbors um let's see yep next one um once you've decided what kind of either poultry in general or chickens that you like, then you have to either order chicks or pullets and the pullets, oh, the cockerels are uh, harder to find, they're more expensive, but they don't require all of the, all of the equipment that you need for chicks. Um, so some of, the, some of the things that you want to do when you have chicks is you have to get, if you wanna do it really, really cheap, the most expensive thing that you probably will need is a red light a heat lamp. Um, and you could use something as simple as pie dishes, the uh, really shallow dishes for them to be able to get into to eat or get water. Uh, but when you're ordering chicks, you can get them from several places. You can go to your farm stores, um, sometimes local farms have them. There's a pretty good group on Facebook, Backyard, Backyard Poultry, um, 
or you can order them from a hatchery that's out of state catalog mail um, online. And the big hatcheries will only ship them in the mail during the warm season. Um, if you get into kind of those colder months on the shoulders, then they charge you extra and put a heat pack in with them, uh, especially if you don't have enough chicks to keep in a box. Um, <clears throat> and I would really recommend getting, if you're ordering from a hatchery, getting electrolytes in the packets that you get with them. Um, because they just usually need a boost. I mean, if you spent two days in a car without any food or water, you'd be pretty tired. <laughs> um, we can go to the next slide. So that's like, once your chicks get here, um, So you've ordered your chicks, you're waiting for them in the mail. Um, you wanna make sure that you're ready for them. So some of the things to think about way before you order chicks is long-term housing. Uh, you want a brooder for your chick that can either go in your house or in your coop. Um, how much pasture access you're gonna give them and how you're going to get food and water to them. Let's go to the next slide, Anna. So when you're building your brooder, I had mentioned that you can put it either in your house or in your coop. Um, in your house is a really nice option because you know it's draft free. Uh, and if you look at this brooder example, uh, you can see the feeders are the lines and the waterers are the circles and the little dots are all the chicks. Uh, there's a heat lamp in the center. And there's a really good scatter pattern in the infographic on the left. And if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see if they're too cold, they'll cluster around the light. If there's a draft, they cluster away from the draft all to one side. And if they're too hot, they kind of just try to get away from the light and each other. Um, a chick's body temperature runs about 105. So you're looking for your temperature to be somewhere around their body temperature so that they're not getting stressed out. The best way to uh, adjust your heat is to actually lift your light up and down. Um, if you have a draft, that can be easily fixed by a piece of cardboard. And one of the best brooders that I've ever come across is just like a giant cardboard box if if your kid had a toy come in a giant cardboard box. Um, one thing I've learned in life is never throw them away. They're super useful for so many things. <laughs> um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll discuss some of the things a little more in depth. Um, you can line the brooder with newspaper or cardboard for the first two or three days. And I'm not talking uh, shredded newspaper or shredded paper, I'm talking flat newspaper. And we do that because the chicks, when you get them, don't know the difference between sawdust and their food. They, they know nothing. Um, you have just turned into their mom. You have to teach them what to do. So you put down the newspaper so that the only thing that is up that they can peck at is their food. Um, and one really important thing to do if you don't have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chickens is to just take their, take, pick them up and just dip their beaks in the water because um, that gives them a little bit of something to drink after they've been shipped in the mail. Yeah, come on up, big guy. Oh. This is my personal assistant. <laughs> um, so another thing that you can do if you haven't spent the money on electrolytes um, that, that the hatchery will send you, then you can mix up uh, molasses with a little bit of vinegar. And uh, I've given a little bit of a recipe there. The one precaution that I would say is um, 
don't use let me sign don't use blackstrap molasses because it's not refined enough and it will act as a laxative and your chicks will get diarrhea um, and die pretty quickly. Uh, the blackstrap molasses can be super helpful in older chickens if you're looking to give them a little bit of diarrhea to run something that was uh, slightly toxic through them. Like if you had a little bit of moldy feed, you could give them a, a little dose of blackstrap molasses just to flush it through, um, but don't give it to your chicks. So the other thing, after they get shipped that far, I've got a really good picture here. Um, the person holding the chicken, that's what we call pasty butt. And it's usually caused by stress and high protein fine foods. So the, the best way to get rid of pasty butt is literally to bring them in the house run some warm water because remember these chicks are at 105 degrees and just stick them in the water you loosen up what we call the dingleberry on their cloaca and just wash it off and once their cloaca is clean you can put them in a towel wrap them up and put them in a bucket um, if you want a better explanation of that you can actually see it being done on our youtube channel um, there are other signs of illness. There's spraddle legged, there's joint diseases, and I included a link in the PowerPoint um, for leg issues and how to treat them. Uh, and Anna can send you the presentation later and you can click on that link and uh, it gives you some really good tips on how to deal with some of that stuff. Uh, I said a red heat lamp earlier. You, they sell ones that aren't red, but the red heat lamps are really, really nice because if the chicks kind of pick on each other, um, they'll, they'll pull out feathers sometimes and the red lights prevent them from seeing the blood on each other. Um, which you can, once they don't need the heat lamps anymore, you can switch out for LED bulbs. And they sell those in red too. So you get really lucky. <laughs> Um, provide grit, which is essentially just dirt. Uh, chickens don't have teeth, so they have what we call a crop, and that if you open it up has kind of serrated edges that rub together um, and chew for them, but they need a little bit of sand in there to do it. So if you happen to be gardening at the time, you can scoop up a little bit of sod off the edge of your garden um, or you can buy grit, but you don't need to. Um, the other thing you wanna make sure you do is I said you could use pie dishes. You can also buy some really fancy chick waterers and feeders, um, which I would do if you're doing uh, birds for meat production every year, because you know that that investment is gonna be used all the time. But if you're, if you're getting laying hens or ducks, um, then you can just use pie dishes. Where there's a question about where should you put the grit in the brooder? Um, so if you're, you're, if you're using, say you're using a pie dish, um, you can put half, half feed and half grit. If you've picked up a piece of sod, you can tuck it into a corner so they can go get it whenever they want. Um, and then in the winter for your adult birds, uh, any corner by their feeder is fine. Um, any water dish that you have when the birds are small, line it with small rocks because they will get in it and drown. However, waterfowl need to wash their faces. Um, so it's a, and they love running into the dish and standing in it and having a great time. So if you have, ooh, Anna's computer went hokey. <laughs> if you have ducks or geese or any kind of waterfowl, um, you can space the rocks out. Uh, 
because they're not as likely to drown, but what they will do is they'll jump in and play around in it and make a giant mess. Um, as they get older and you take them outside, you can actually build them a little pond as long as they have a ramp to be able to get up out of it. But they really, really need to be able to wash their eyes off um, because they get really gummy and they won't be able to blink if you don't give them anything to wash their faces with. So the other thing is if you're doing uh, guinea hens or quail, uh, they need pretty high levels of protein. So, so just do a little research. Um, you might have to get some game bird feed for other, other breeds and species. So if we go to the next slide, Anna. So once your chicks have gotten big enough and gotten outside, then um, if you're super handy and really fast at construction, which I'm not, um, you can still be building your coop while your chicks are maturing enough to be outside. Usually takes, as you saw in the picture before, it takes about four weeks for them to feather out. Um, I would wait six to eight weeks before you stick them outside because they need to be able to handle drafts. It's kind of like hardening off your vegetables for the garden. Um, so when you're deciding, designing your coop, uh, you want to think about mobility, manure. Uh, the, the chickens will perch up onto stuff and poop down. Ducks poop everywhere, but they're super messy around their water dishes. Um, guineas perch really, really high, as high into their coop as you can get, and like anything that knows how to fly, poop where they roost. Um, so I've seen people that will build uh, their clean out door right next to the roosts, or I've seen situations where you can put in dowels that are, and have a slatted floor, and it falls down into an underground manure pit underground manure pit <laughs> and they can scrape it out without disturbing the birds. Um, it's just something to think about uh, that I tell people and they don't always listen and then they go oh yeah they poop. <laughs> um, so that the the flooring is a consideration. Uh, chicken manure is really dry um, so you want something that's kind of smooth and pretty easy to scrape without a lot of nails to catch on. Um, or you're gonna have to water it down. And given that, then you want a floor that's maybe washable. Um, there's also the potential for different groups. Um, so think about the, the groupings that you want. Birds are pretty hard to integrate. Um, always, always have a sick pen or two because at some point somebody's gonna get sick or if they, suffer a predator attack, you want to be able to separate them from everyone else. And um, predator protection is always a slight challenge um, because weasels are really, really smart and raccoons will kill them all for fun as well. Uh, possums. <laughs> um, so generally you want it, you want to put up chicken wire or uh, some sort of small uh, fabric on your windows so they can't get in. Um, if you happen to have a very permanent structure and you have electricity in it, I know a really, really good product um, that you, it's, no, it's not a, it's not a sound wave emitter, it's a sonic emitter. Uh, and I found it at Walmart of all places and I plugged it into the wall and all of a sudden all my rodents were gone. Um, but that works really well, well for rodents. It doesn't work on anything bigger. And I've got a question. It says, we've been hardening off our five week old laying chicks by leaving them in the run outside during the day and bringing them in at night. When will they be able to tol tolerate overnight in the coop? Probably now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, if they've got, 
<laughs> they've got all their feathers and they've been hanging out outside for the day and your nighttime temperatures are um, above 40 then you're they're pretty they're pretty ready to go because um, overnight in the coop is still inside it's not like they're out in the trees <laughs> don't do that <laughs> um, so the different types of bedding you can use you can use shaving sawdust newspaper straw hay um, there's all sorts of things you can use. If you're regionally next to it, peanut shells. Um, I will note that newspaper, like I said before, is not organically approved. Um, the chemicals that they use to treat it and the dyes that they use, the ink uh, keeps it from being organically approved because the chickens will do a lot of pecking and they just might eat it. Um, that's another consideration if you have straw or hay for bedding and you want them to be organic, buy organic straw or hay because they absolutely will eat it. And then there's the different uh, management styles. You can clean it all the time. You can use a bedded pack uh, where you just keep adding bedding. Um, or you can do a composted bedded pack. And if you're going to compost it, especially with chickens and not so much with ducks or geese, uh, you need to add water. The ducks and geese are wet enough um, that just because of the way they play, they'll add a lot of water in and their feces is fairly wet because of who they are. What's the recommended size for a coop for chicks, six chickens? Um, there's no such thing as too big and hay is a great insulator. There is definitely such thing as too small. Um, and we'll go into that with uh, meat birds is specifically a little, little later on here. Um, when we, just a quick note about the stable groups and integrating them, I get asked a lot about, uh, how to integrate chickens. Um, you've got an older group of chickens, you've got a younger group of chickens, and it's a really, really good project for your teens that have had way too much screen time. Um, is you stick them in the coop all together at night, and then in the morning, you let them fight for a little while and then separate them again. <laughs> um, and it takes about a month of doing that before they finally just give it up and like, fine, I guess you can stay. The other thing that you can do that's super helpful if you're starting with a, a coop that you're building is to actually have uh, two separate pens or a wall that you can remove. So then they can see each other and kind of posturate each other all day. And you can still put them together and remove them into their own space and they can still make faces at each other. Is, so there's a question, if they poop under the roost, does bedding get placed there too or just in other parts of the coop? Um, no, you don't have to put, you don't have to put bedding under the coop, especially if it's falling to the outside. Um, if you are gonna have a manure pile outside because it's falling down through the floor, I would do something like putting some sort of rubber mat or uh, a slippery surface to be able to scoop it up and take it away because it's you you don't want to waste your manure it's so valuable for your plants um, once it's mellowed out a little bit don't ever put raw chicken poop directly on plants put it into your soil in the fall <laughs> and let it just melt because <laughs> it will burn them um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Next slide, Anna. Yeah. So here's the spacing requirements um, to do chickens organically. Uh, the reason that I've highlighted the one and a half feet squared until 16 weeks old is because when you're building your chicken tractor that you move around the yard, if you have meat birds, you're only raising them until they're 16 weeks old. 
and the space requirements for that standard chicken tractor, 10 by 12, is only a foot and a half of space once those birds have matured. And that's for about 80 birds. Um, if you're raising them past, if you have plans on raising them past that, or you know that you're gonna process them yourself and you're only gonna do a few at a time because of the breed that you have, either give them more or give them uh, a fenced in area like in this picture. This is a really good example of meat birds on pasture. They've got plenty of space. It's the shelter that they have is super light and movable. Um, and uh, they're, not getting, they're not getting crammed into one little space for too long. Um, as if you have, if you have laying hens that you're going to keep for a while or your meat birds you know that you're going to keep for a while we ideally want three square feet per bird at the minimum that allows them to stand up flap their wings turn around kind of kind of be normal chickens in a very small space um it it it's a balance between uh efficiency and um uh, all I can think of is humanity. <laughs> um, so here's this is this is some of the the math behind how much space we've considered. Uh, I can't think of the word. <laughs> Anybody? Um, yeah, this, this is just how, com well, yeah, compassion, um, but humane, humane, sustainable, anyway, um, one thing I will say is if you do have meat birds, no matter what you have, um, there are there are not any certified certified organic establishments in the state of Maine that are processing uh, waterfowl. Um, and if you have chickens that you want processed, the slaughterhouses want you to call them and schedule a date as soon as you get your chicks. Um, that gives them enough warning and you, you're sure you have a date um, don't get chickens and then think you're going to do it and decide to try to call in slaughterhouse. It's not going to work. Um, and that goes for, for all of them. Um, so that is my one recommendation. Do not get stuck trying to process 50 birds at your home because they've done it and it's not fun. So I had talked about the clean bedding in a, on a different slide is that you either add it to the top or you change it regularly in these systems that stay still. Um, because uh, urine and feces is really, really high in ammonia and it will give them breathing problems. Um, and it seriously reduces your efficiency. And who wants to hang around uh, in an outhouse all day? So those are the stationary system requirements. Um, and we can talk more about pasturing in a few minutes. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, that's fine with me. This is just another example. Um, this coop, according to 16 week meat bird standards, which is what this was built to, will house 80, 80 birds, um, but you have to move it every day uh, or twice a day for them not to turn their environment into just a disgusting mire. Um, this is not a very big shelter. Uh, this is 12 by 12 and it, it was built for meat birds and it currently houses eight laying hens and a rooster and they fit kind of nicely in there. So you can see the, the tarp just goes over the top. It's built out of um, cattle panels stretched over the, the 
bottom structure and there's a little bit of chicken wire on the inside to keep them from flying away if uh, escaping. <laughs> um, if we choose to roll up the sides, uh, you can see the, the back where the chickens come out. They have a little door that's got a tarp that comes up and down, little curtain. And uh, the inside now, since it's been retrofitted for laying hens, there's a little nest box in there and some roosts for them at night. And full disclosure, this is my mom's. So she likes to keep a piece of big, a big piece of cardboard down uh, from one of her grandkids' toys that we have and it's nice and slippery and her that little yellow bucket is the poop bucket and she collects it all up uh, every time she moves them and I steal it from my garden. <laughs> so if Anna goes to the next slide we'll see some more examples of some stationary coops. Uh, you've got the one all the way to the right is big and fancy, uh, super super stable. Uh, you can set up a brooder in there. Um, the one criticism I have is that it, if you're not careful with your grain or your scratch feed, these big really stationary coops turn into uh, rat hotels. Uh, and if you're really lucky, you'll get a weasel that only eats the rats, but you're usually not that lucky. Um, just below it, there's a really nice one that's movable. Uh, and you can pull that around the yard if you happen to be super fancy and have a four-wheeler. Uh, the little red one is one that you could use with move with a dolly and it comes with its own little cage that the chickens have outdoor access to and the one in the upper left-hand corner is another super nice um, permanent structure and I like it a lot because it's got all that green foliage around it um, that the chickens can scratch in, hide under, they can get away from predators really easily with that one. Um, and if anybody's got any other questions, just keep asking. <laughs> and I can move to the next slide. Fidel likes to think he can run the, the computer for me. Ooh, portable power for the coop. What would you like to know? Ours is not wired. Um, what kinds of things do you, do you wanna do in your coop that you want lights for? Oh. Um, if you have, so the, the little summertime coop uh, that we drag around, we do not keep them in in the winter, obviously. Um, but if you've got one, so yes, you need lights on them if you want them to lay through the winter. Uh, and it's super helpful to keep your water thought out. Um, but we normally, what we normally do and have had plans for is to uh, take it and park it because you're not going to move it around in the winter. Um, you really don't want to shovel that much snow. <laughs> you take it and park it up next to say, if you have the opportunity, the south side of your house or a larger existing structure. And then your power you can run out with an extension cord and cover it with mats or dig just a little trench and run it through some PVC pipe and just kind of cover it so that the moisture doesn't get into it. Um, wrap any connections in a plastic bag with some duct tape. That'll keep the moisture out of those. And uh, that's what we've done before. We've, we've run extent, we've parked them right up close to the building and we've run extension cords out to them. Uh, and it seems to work nice. Maybe silly questions, but will chickens fly away? They, so chickens, will fly about as much as a wild turkey does. Oh, you, um, and going, going back really quick to the, the coop. Yes, you can, you can use solar power in your coop. I don't know how to do it. Um, so if you know how to do it, kudos to you. <laughs> 
Um, but yes, chickens will fly. Uh, they're built, chickens are actually native to the jungle. So they're, they're built to go from branch to branch and glide around in the, in the low shrubbery. Um, and you can keep them from flying by trimming their wings. You have to do it every year. Um, it doesn't hurt them. It just kind of makes them grumpy. Um, and uh, there's a really good instructional video on our YouTube channel <laughs> about which, which ones, which feathers to cut. Um, you can either cut both wings or just one. And it seems to work really well. It just makes the chickens grumpy because they can't get out anymore. And eagles are... Eagles and even even large hawks are a danger. Um, I actually had a large hawk go after the chickens here at home the other day, and our rooster, who's giant, fought him off and chased all his ladies inside. Um, so, uh, one of the ways to keep the eagles off of them is to make sure they have plenty of places to hide under, uh, or the darker colored birds um, are less susceptible to attack because they blend in with the ground. Um, a couple more questions. If people are using electricity in the coop. Yes. Um, so someone made the comment about the electricity and uh, the risk of fire, which is absolutely true. <laughs> Um, our neighbors do production hens and there's currently 800 chicks in our backyard um, and they buy these kind of old camper trailers because they move their hens around the field and they have parked them in a space where if they light on fire they're not going to hurt anything and they did that because they did in all the years they've been doing it, have one light on fire, but it was only one and it was out in the middle of the field, so it didn't bother anything. Um, it is a consideration. That's another consideration with your heat lamps and your brooders. One, you don't want them too hot for the chicks. The other is you don't want them so close to the bedding that it gets it hot. Um, so another question is suggestions for duck houses. Ducks actually don't need as much cold protection as chickens. They're just better suited to the cold. I'm not gonna let you eat ranch dressing. <laughs> um, so uh, the, best, the best thing that I ever did for ducks was to make it uh, almost like a bathtub or a pool uh, where the whatever flooring I had kind of extended halfway up the sides so that one, it was easily shovelable, Shove yeah. One, I could shovel it easily, and two, it, the moisture wouldn't get into the seams and rot it all out. And the brooder heat plate is a great idea. I know people that use them for their piglets as well. Um, that all depends on your price point. I don't know how much you paid for it, but it is safer than a bulb, which is another good reason for bringing them in the house, because. If you've only got six or so, then the house, one, you're there all the time, and two, it's just easier to keep at a consistent temperature uh, rather than having a, a bunch of uh, extension cords and um, a bunch of different lights and trying to monitor for drafts. So I really like the, the brooder heat plate. That's a great idea. Um, caring for your chickens. Uh, because you're all doing backyard chickens and poultry, then you either have a concern for the welfare of your chickens, you know the eggs taste better, you want clean meat, uh, you want to know where your food comes from. So we're going to think about the natural kind of way that chickens are. So they need the fresh air, the sunshine, space to move, Shelter, healthy feed, which mold free, um, good protein, plenty of pasture. Um, chickens really like variety. 
wooded areas chickens love um, because there's plenty of bugs for them to eat. Chickens will eat grass. It's not their primary diet, um, but they do put a little bit in, in their gullet just for variety. Uh, but the woods is great. They love it in there. And it doubles as kind of a little bit of protection from the eagles because the eagles don't, they don't like to hang out in the wooded areas as much. So, um, clean water. Uh, a lot of times uh, when you have the waterers for the chickens, if you don't have an actual nipple that they're pecking at to get their water, you want to make sure that the biofilm that builds up in your waterers is cleaned out. You don't want algae. You don't want a lot of bacteria. Um, so once a day, go out, dump it, give it a scrub, move on. Uh, dust bath area, it's especially important in winter. Uh, and you can use diatomaceous earth in your, your dust bath area, but you want to make sure it's in a well-ventilated area because diatomaceous earth is uh, essentially little rock crystals that work to cut up the, the carapaces of any kind of external parasites. And if we breathe that in or they breathe that in, in large amounts, it tends to be a little hard on them. So if you're putting down a lot, wear a mask, make sure your chickens are outside um, and let it all just settle down. I would also mix it in with other dust. Oh, Anna, next slide. So pasture, some things to think about is you can reduce your feed consumption um, and it depends on the species and your environment. Um, Predator protection will be needed. And like I said, that that's, can be from eagles, that can be from the neighbor dog. Uh, I've had more people complain about the neighbor dog came over and played with my animals till they were dead. Um, and it has happened to me personally a lot. Um, <laughs> the neighbor had a very fun loving boxer that had fun with my ducks. <laughs> um, so, Fences, fences work great. Um, you can mix them in with other livestock. Uh, one thing that people like to do is rotate their chickens after their cows or their horses because the chickens will scratch up the patties or the piles and kind of spread it out, pick out the bugs but in the process of spreading it out. Uh, they're, they're spreading that manure on your field so that there's more microbial action. Um, it improves your pasture because they're scratching it and uh, it extends the season on your pastures and it extends the season on your egg laying. Um, you get more vitamins in your eggs. Mixing with goats is great. I will note that pasturing chickens and turkeys is the only thing that I know that is can be a problem. Um, they can trade what's called blackhead back and forth. It's a protozoa found in their poop um, and in earthworms. And if your birds are just getting super, super skinny and dying, and this is mostly in chickens, uh, in turkeys, excuse me, it's, it's the turkeys that will get skinny and die. Um, the chickens can suffer from it, but most of the time they're just carrying it around, giving it to the turkeys. So, Pasturing them with anything that's not another species of poultry is uh, A-OK, -okay, and it's only turkeys that you really have to worry about. If, so there's a question, if we'll be letting them out to pasture slash free range, should we clip their wings? Curious about pros and cons of wing clipping and reasons to do it. Um, if you're just gonna let them free range, then don't worry about clipping their wings. It's actually super helpful for them if they're getting away from your neighborhood dog. Um, and the reason for clipping their wings is if, if you're managing a group of chickens organically and you want and you need to know what they're eating, then you want them to stay within the parameters of the pen that you've given them. So you clip their wings so they can't do that kind of uh, kind of hand glider flight out over your fence. 
and it works for ducks too. I had a Muscovy duck that was super wily. Um, it works as in as far as uh, they can't fly. Muscovy ducks are really, really, really smart and they will climb if you give them a sturdy enough to fence to climb. Hawks are tough because they'll, they'll often eyeball your chickens and try to pick them up and realize that they're bigger than they thought and then drop them. So if, if your chickens are like, if you hear them out in the coop, just clucking and squawking and carrying on like they've just survived a near-death experience, then go out and check them, keep an eye on them for a couple of days. Somebody that got hurt uh, might be hiding, just sitting in the corner. Um, and that's one thing to note about birds in general is that they're prey animals, so they're gonna hide how they're feeling until they're almost dead. Um, so the, the more you're watching your birds, the more you're interacting with them, the more that you'll see something is off. Hannah, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll keep this train moving. Um, after pasturing, we had talked about kind of like reducing your feed from anywhere from 25% to 100%. Um, there, here are some of the, there's some of the math behind uh, feed requirements. And the one thing I will note, because math is not my strong suit, is if you have broilers, uh, one really good rule of thumb is feed them only as much as they'll clean up by early afternoon. And I mean early afternoon, because if you put feed in their feeders, they will come back to the coop and you can close them in at night. And too much feed will make them super aggressive towards each other. Um, also high amounts of protein. You might think giving a meat bird a lot of protein is a good thing, but they put on muscle too fast, uh, they get too heavy for themselves, and in the meantime they're really aggressive toward each other, um, which is counterproductive to, to wanting to raise meat and uh, really disturbing when you just hear chickens fighting all the time. Um, so if you want the math, you'll get it. If you don't want the math, just gauge how much they can clean up. I got a question uh, about stationary coops. Mm -hmm. Does buying wire, burying wire mesh into the ground around the outside edges help keep rodents and raccoons and foxes out? Yes, um, it does. It's really labor intensive, but for your kind of either winter run or stationary coops, it tends to be worth the effort. Um, and the raccoons are a tough one because they have those wily little hands and if your, if your fence holes are big enough, they'll reach through the fence and snap the necks of your chickens while they're sleeping. Um, so either make sure everyone's in at night or make sure the roosts are away from the edge of the fence um, or any ventilation that that if you can't afford to get really really small mesh uh, put the windows up high and the roosts down below it but you're just wanting to keep you're wanting to keep your chickens out of raccoon reach <laughs> If you, so I got a question, did you say put feed out around sunset to get them to come back in at night? You put the feed in your coop. Um, yeah, if you, if they clean up their feed by early afternoon and then you're putting feed in their coop, they'll come running right in and you won't have to go get them. So then if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, after making sure that they have clean water and food, uh, there's watching them for health concerns, which um, there's a there can be a lot there can be a lot to to keep an eye on. But preventing is always better than having to treat. So keep an eye on them. Um, things to watch for are the color and quality of their comb and their wattles. Um, 
their level of activity, the quality of their manure, uh, and their growth rate and egg production. Um, so back when we were talking about coops, this is why I stressed you should have a sick pen or two. Um, so in case of illness, uh, the initial treatments that you can do or you can isolate your bird um, or and while they're in isolation you can put echinacea garlic and oregano oil in their water and uh, it's generally if you're using an essential oil it's a drop per gallon of each apple cider vinegar works really really well um, that's four teaspoons per gallon uh, you can also give the apple cider vinegar to brand new chicks that, you, that you've gotten in the mail, um, but don't go over four teaspoons per gallon because it can be pretty hard on them. Oh, what's the other half of this thing? So symptoms to watch for, uh, loose or bloody stool. That's either coccidiosis or salmonella. Um, you can get them vaccinated for salmonella, and I would. Um, also, you can have them, if you're running a production flock, you can actually have them tested for salmonella and E. coli. And there are flocks that are certified free of E. coli. Um, any kind of open mouth breathing indicates heat stress or pneumonia. Um, or mycotoxin, and the mycotoxin can be caught from wild birds, uh, and that's another reason why you want to be limiting how much scratch feed you put out. It's not just a draw for rats, it's a draw for wild birds, and the wild birds will come down and can possibly infect your, your flock. Um, and the mycotoxin isn't transmittable to people, but it will affect their egg production and their growth rate. Um, heat stress is pretty easy to fix um, with fans and shade and some water. Uh, by the time they're sitting with their wings out and ohm of mouth breathing, they're pretty hot. You want to nip that right in the bud. Uh, so the reason we monitor comb and wattle color is because really, really pale combs or something that's a deep purple means they're not getting enough uh, oxygen. Um, and if you see this in combination with loose or bloody stools and open mouth breathing, you should probably call a vet and have your flock tested for something that's really, really contagious. Um, and it might mean uh, culling your flock and starting over. Um, but better that than infecting the entire neighborhood with whatever your birds have. Um, some other things to watch for self-isolating. They'll sit in the corner all puffed up looking really sad. And that could either be from injury or uh, sometimes they get egg bound. Um, and if you, if you find you have an egg bound chicken, please don't squeeze them. You'll break the egg inside them. Um, they could be picking at the saddle area uh, and that's an indicator their saddle area is is right in front of their tail and right behind their wings kind of on their back um where if you imagined like a cartoon of somebody riding a chicken right where the saddle would sit um and if they're doing that it's an indicator that they've got mites and you that's where you can treat them with diatomaceous earth um i got the bright idea one year to dry pluck my chickens and I ended up with feather mites, <laughs> which didn't bite me, but they crawled all over me for a week while I treated everything with diatomaceous earth in my house. <laughs> um, other essential oil treatments can be used, but they require a lot of handling because you have to pick up your chicken and put the essential oil on them. Um, and it all depends on how friendly you are with your chickens. So, uh, it's, it's easy to make sure that they have a dust bath. Um, one of the other things that I've seen is if the scales on their feet are raised up and starting to look kind of crusty, then they have scaly mites. And that's really, really easy to treat if you just, uh, make sure that their feet are coated with Vaseline. Um, 
and it I just keep coating them until they're the scales go back to normal. So those are some of the more common things and things to kind of watch out for that can be uh, either a pain in the butt or scary. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. The big one, predator protection. Um, in the photo with the dog, that's actually a guardian breed dog. Uh, and you can do it, but it's it can be a little hard to get guardian dogs to bond with poultry um, because it's a it's it's a bird to mammal thing and they'll do it if you stick them in with the birds and completely ignore them um, and then just keep sticking them back in but if you're not prepared to deal with a the dog there are there are other ways um, let me go back to the chat here because there's a question where can you get diatomaceous earth? Uh, if you go into your local hardware store uh, or feed store, they have it. Agway's got it. You just ask for it. Um, it's commonly called DE, but anybody that deals with plants knows what it is because it's it's a really good um, deterrent for your common garden pests which is why it works on feather mites. <laughs> um, but like I said before, don't, don't breathe a lot of it in. It's, it's not good for your lungs because it is a crystal. It, it will cut whatever it's touching. So that's my spiel on dogs. Um, don't get a dog if you're not ready for it. Uh, you can use fencing, especially the electrified netting. That will keep a lot of walking, climbing critters out. Um, make sure that they have some sort of shade that they can hide under for aerial attacks. Um, that's where those chicken tractors come in handy. You can park a trailer out, a flatbed trailer out there. Uh, you can get those for pretty cheap. The flatbed trailers are also really nice because you can actually hang their feet and water off of them. Um, and they can all run under there if they see an eagle. Um, I had said earlier that choosing darker breeds naturally camouflages them. That's really apparent uh, when you've got laying birds next, uh, pastured next to a bunch of white meat birds. Um, and that doesn't exclude ducks. I have not had an eagle go after the geese that I had, I think just because they were huge. Um, but I, I have had the eagles circle and eyeball the ducks and strike them and not be able to lift them. And then you're left needing to put a duck down because it's been slashed to ribbons. So it's just one thing to consider. The ducks are kind of more more passive than the, the chickens or, or the guineas are. Um, guineas are super, super susceptible to predator attack when they're setting. Um, they will they will hide like nobody's business if they're not setting, but if they are setting on eggs, they just, they're just dumb. <laughs> they will just let anything eat them. Um, it was the only time I lost my guineas was one of them decided to go brood under a bush and she got eaten like that. Um, they just don't move. So that's one thing to consider if you're raising your own guineas, make sure that they're, they're going broody in the barn, keep them safe. Uh, another thing that I had really good luck with was, um, as odd as it sounds, I was having trouble with a fox and I just started to take my morning constitution out by their pen and the fox stopped coming around. Um, so you can, save it up in bottles. You just save up your urine in bottles. You can buy predator urine. Um, but if you put that around the outsides of your property, especially if you're free ranging your birds, it can be really, really helpful in keeping them away. Um, it's another 
pro to having a dog. You don't even need a guardian dog. You just need to take your dog for a walk around your property line and wherever they pee, it kind of deters things. Um, there's the obvious, close the birds in at night. And if you've got guinea hens, that can present a challenge just because they want to be up high. And if you don't encourage them into their coop with food far ahead of sunset, then they're not going to end up in your coop. They're going to end up in the trees. Um, and if anybody else has any other suggestions on predator protection, I'm always open. <laughs> Let's see. Nine week old chickens. We'd like to have them free range. What's the best way to ensure they stay around home? Um, so you find something that they really, really like to eat and you give them their treats close to home. Um, things like mealworms, chickens really, really love. Um, making sure that you feed them at the same times all the time, they're, they're really, really ruled by a schedule. So if they know that their food, especially laying hens, if they're only getting their actual food and not just their scratch grain at night when you want them to come home, then they'll come home expecting it because they know they're gonna get a meal. Um, and another good way to make sure that they stay close to home is to put up those stations where they can hide under things and feel safe um, because they won't stray too far from those things. Let's see, next slide. Egg production. Uh, hands will begin laying anywhere between six and eight months. Um, and if you want to figure out who's laying and put them in a separate area, uh, you can feel the pelvic widths and, and compare. Uh, so whoever has a wider pelvis is the one that has started laying. It even is helpful in older birds. Um, this isn't just for young birds because the older ones, their pelvis will relax and kind of contract a little bit when they're going through molt and not laying. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, you keep light on in the coop and it stimulates the pituitary so that they keep laying. Uh, red lights don't work, but uh, the red lights are nice to have, again, for any kind of feather pecking. I, it's, there's a question, is there a battery operated light that works well for this purpose? Yeah, any kind of light will work. Um, there's some that I've seen that people put in their closets that are tap light, and you can put in a couple of those. Uh, those are battery powered. You probably find something like that at Home Depot or Walmart, um, or ask your local hardware store. Uh, they're likely to have something like that. Um, the other instance where they'll stop laying is when they're molting. And when they start molting, you want to change the rations so that they're getting higher levels of methionine. And you can find higher levels of methionine in cooked eggs. You can hard boil a bunch of eggs and cut them up. Or fish meal is a great source. Um, or birds on pasture will eat bugs and the bugs carry a bunch of methionine. But generally, they are molting at the end of a season. So that's something that you're gonna to wanna to feed to them, I'll change their ration and feed them a little extra. And don't, don't feed them raw eggs or eggshells that have not been washed because you don't want them to eat their own eggs. So those are some of the fast and bads about just them and their egg production. Um, cleaning and storing eggs. Uh, eggs have a shelf life of up to 30 days if you wash them, um, 10 weeks if they're unwashed, and that is actual research. Um, but there are some 
there are some anecdotal things that I've seen that said you can keep them in the right temperature in the right environments for months or year. Um, I've never tried it. And uh, that's that 10 week un unwashed is because they have uh, a bloom. It's just kind of chicken slime uh, that covers the egg as it comes out. <laughs> um, and I've only ever been able to do it with chickens. The ducks and the the ducks specifically are so wet just in general um, that I've never been able to keep them clean enough that I didn't feel like washing them. Geese tend to be very clean about their eggs um, and every other dry fowl. It's just for some reason ducks are super wet and even when you're incubating eggs, duck eggs you have to spray with water because they just like to be moist. Um, when you're washing the eggs, you want the water 20 degrees warmer than the egg temperature. Uh, the egg, you have to remember that the eggshell is porous and hot water will push any bacteria in through the pores, into the, through the shell and into your egg. Hi, I'm cry, you're loud. I'll be quiet. I know. Um, you can use a little bit of bleach, or you can use some vinegar or hydrogen peroxide, but don't soak them or submerge them. You want to just kind of run water over them. Um, and another way that I've known people to, to, want to clean them is to use just a little bit of light sandpaper and kind of just scratch off whatever organic matter is on the outside. Um, if you're selling eggs, your labels have to include your name, your farm name, uh, the grade, the size, and the count of how many you're selling. You can sell ungraded eggs, um, but they have to be labeled as such. And the best way, since we have people from several different states, is to check with your state's Department of Ag, and they will help you determine your local laws. At what... <laughs> A uh, question, at what age will a production hen shift from being a layer to being better off as a meat lady? Um, so chickens will lay productively for three years. Uh, ducks are about the same. Um, geese are, geese only really lay in the spring. Um, and I honestly don't know for how many years they're good for, um, probably three to five, but that deciding, deciding when to retire your layers, uh, is something that you can, you can kind of figure out with their pelvic widths. Um, if she has totally stopped laying, then she'll be really, really narrow in the rear end. Um, and when they're between the ages of three and five, they'll slow down maybe an egg every other day, um, an egg every couple of days. If they're over five, they might give you an egg twice a week. Um, and it all really kind of depends on the chicken and the breed. Uh, but uh, I have an old hen out here that is still laying about an egg a day, and she's five. The biggest problem I have with her is that no matter how much, uh, how much extra calcium that she has access to, her shells are still really brittle, um, and she occasionally will drive me crazy and eat an egg. Um, one thing that you can do to keep them from eating eggs is you can buy a ceramic egg uh, and put it in your nest box and the ceramic eggs will do two things. They'll teach your young birds how to lay in the area that you want them to lay in. And they're so hard that when a, a hen goes to peck the egg, it hurts. Um, 
if you're really crafty, you can blow out an egg and fill it with hot sauce and they don't like the hot sauce. Um, but honestly, if you can figure out who's eating your eggs, you um, might consider retiring that bird. Um, when your birds are learning to lay in their nest boxes, they will develop the habit to lay in there, but uh, to get them to learn that habit, generally you want to leave them in until about 10 a.m. because they, for some reason, all lay in the morning, even the ducks. Um, uh, and make your nest boxes inviting. They want to lay their egg in a quiet place that's secluded um, and comfy and uh, it, so one of my friends made me laugh recently because they said, well, we've got, we've got six, we've got eight nest boxes. Why don't we get eight birds? And I laughed. Uh, I said, your birds are all going to pick the same nest box and lay in it. <laughs> um, so generally about a half as many nest boxes as you have birds is sufficient. Um, they will fight over their favorite nest box. Uh, chickens, I got a question about how long do they live? Uh, 10, 12 years, <laughs> much longer than their productive lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, they go way longer than they stop slowing down on eggs. Um, so that's why a lot of people put them in the pot, because the longer they live, uh, the stringier they get. Um, if you've got a stew chicken that you decided to put in the pot uh, at 10 years old, because you just never caught her or she was still giving you an egg and she didn't end up being your friend, um, please put her in the crock pot. <laughs> That's not a frying chicken. Uh, so poultry processing classes uh, we have at Mofka and hopefully we will be having some this year. Uh, if you don't want to process your own birds, um, like I said, you reserve your spot with your butcher as soon as you get your chicks. Um, and if you want to sell them, the, if you're raising birds for meat and you want to sell them, uh, the Maine State Meat Inspection Program has some really good information regarding slaughter res regulations, and they have a directory of custom meat and poultry uh, that will give you the name and the number and location of everyone that's licensed to process in the state of Maine. Um, and that is very state specific. Maine runs a meat inspection program. Other states rely on the USDA, um, but I would check with your state department of ag. Uh, there's usually some fairly good resources because that's what they're paid to do. And just a reminder to check with your state regulatory agencies for both egg and meat production because they can be different from state to state. Um, and if you're raising chickens, make sure your city, your town, your housing authority um, will allow for your poultry and they may have some restrictions like banning roosters, not wanting pea fowl, um, guineas, even though people, the, the logical like I got guineas because they eat ticks, they're they make a raucous noise and some of your neighbors might not like it. Um, so just check before you get them rather than having the fight after you get them and possibly having to get rid of them and pay a fine. <laughs> um, and our next slide, I believe is our resources. So um, Anna, if you wanna stop sharing your screen and then open it up for any remaining questions, we'll go.
And Jackie in the chat, someone says, can you split a flock into two tractors in the day and then put them back in the same coop at night? Yeah, that's not a bad way to do it. Um, kudos to you for wanting to take the time to sort out chickens every day. <laughs> uh, if that, maybe, maybe an easier way of doing that is to split your coop in half and have doors at either end. Um, just to, because you're going to have to get out there at like daybreak before they hop off their roosts and go sort chickens out because they will fight. So there is that. But if you're an early riser, <laughs> have at it. Camille asks, how often should coop bedding be cleaned? Oh, um, so that depends on kind of the space that they're in and how many chickens that you've got. But any time that you're noticing them being, like if, if you walk into the coop and you go, oh God, then, then clean them up. <laughs> Do you recommend half the nest boxes to number of hens? Yes. Because they'll all, I'm serious, they will, they will pick their favorite nest box and you'll have a dozen eggs in there. We at Mofka are always available for questions. Uh, we're a quick phone call or email away. And there's a question, is it necessary to shut their coop door at night if they're in a fixed run with a permanent coop? Yep, because critters will get it right in the door. Uh, there are some really fancy setups that do it automatically on a timer. Um, I, last time I looked, I think there were like, 150 or 200 dollars um so if anyone finds resources for lights in permanent coops without power already sweet share them please and we thank you all for joining us